talking to me? Are you talking? What the fuck? You talking to me? You fucking talking to me? You, you talking to me? I mean, there's nobody. Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody to Pop Culture Philosophers PCP Movie Night. Had to get that bit out of the way before, you know, everybody's going to want to do that bit. So I just had to get it out of the way. Station, pop, pop, boom. Welcome to PCP Movie Night. Tonight we're talking about the very first Martin Scorsese film that we're covering here for PCP Movie Night, which blows me away. We haven't done any yet, but we're changing that. We're talking about Taxi Driver. There's my beautiful steel book edition of Taxi Driver on Blu-ray. Love this film. Hadn't seen it in a while. And we got a great PCP panel tonight to discuss this film. It was like the fourth or fifth, I think, film from Martin Scorsese. We'll get into all of it later. But we can't do the show without an authentic New Yorker. So just like Pace Picante sauce, every time someone goes, Fable, we go, you mean New York City? What's up, Fable? Hey! <laughs> Station. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, just oh, chilling, man. man. Thank you for being here, brother. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, definitely uh, love to be here when they're doing Martin Scorsese, for sure. Oh, yeah. Love that director. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Another Scorsese fan who's never seen this film is Brooks. So what's up, Brooks? So, you know, sometimes I think and I hope that, you know, the rain will come they come along and just wash all of the scum away. But every week, you guys are still here. <laughs> I know it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Speaking of scum on the street, it's Verno. What is up? Hey, what I'm talking about how you doing? That segue, yeah. Hey, what's going on, fellas? Just good to be here. You know, authentic uh, Brooklyn boy myself. So uh, you know, this movie's near and dear to my heart. Nice, nice, nice to hear. For real, you're from Brooklyn? Uh, no, but that character I'm all right, doing all right, right now, I think he is. <laughs> well, coming straight from Brooklyn, Huntsville, Alabama. It's Jelani. What is up, my man? Uh, station, and are you talking to me? I don't know. Are, are you talking to me? I mean, I don't see anyone else around. It's are always one of those bits me? that you think is from a gangster film, right? But mm. it, it's from Taxi Driver, right? But it gets lumped in yeah. with all the other bits, right? So, yeah. Hell yeah. So we're going to be talking about Taxi Driver. Like I said, 1976. This is a movie that is near and dear to my heart. I mean, I really like it. It seems like in modern days, like when I first announced this, there were people that were like, oh man, you really, you really doing you're doing Taxi Driver? Isn't that movie cringy? Isn't that movie? I'm like, I don't think you understand the point of this movie. Because if you think the point in this movie is that Robert De Niro's character of Travis is a hero, <laughs> well, we'll see what everybody interprets it as today. But cinematography by Michael Chapman, who did a lot of work with Scorsese. This was written by Paul Schrader, um, a really, really great film. Bernard Herman, who we'll know from Psycho fame, doing the score. Lots to talk about. I think this movie... And I hadn't seen it in probably like 10, 12, 15 years, right? This movie's damn hypnotizing to me. It's mesmerizing. Yeah. It is such an experience from the very opening shots. It's got this ethereal, subtle, dreamlike quality to it, right? And it's this slow descent into this slow descent of the madness of Travis, I think, what, Bickle or something like that? Bickle. Bickle. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. A brilliant performance from Robert De Niro. He was just coming off. Now, Scorsese had done Mean Streets, and he had worked with De Niro in Mean Streets, which is a fantastic film. Harvey Keitel's in that film as well. And he's all Harvey Keitel's in his first film, Who's That Knocking on My Door? Um, which is a pretty solid film as well. Second film was Boxcar Bertha. I love me some Martin Scorsese. So anyway, so he decides to put this movie together. He, he wants Robert De Niro to be in it. And then it just so happens that when his schedule frees up to be able to do this movie, they just had Godfather 2. So Robert De Niro is like this huge star all of a sudden, helps really level up Scorsese and the appeal of his films because of this movie in particular. Man, it holds up so well. It holds up so well. It's still relevant today. It captures a time and a vibe and a seedy nature of New York City that isn't quite- New York New City? Here. Yeah, New York okay. City. But uh, I damn love it. I think it's, like I said, dreamlike. It's got this hazy quality to it. Brilliant performances. Well written. It's a subtle film, though. There's a lot there that's shown visually. There's a lot there that's shown subtextually that's not just exactly on the surface. And you could easily just pick up from the surface level of this movie that this is like, you know, a parade for incels or some shit like that, right? 
But that's not what this movie's exploring. This movie is exploring a lot of themes, and we're going to be getting into all of that. So thank you out there in the chat for joining us. We want you to join the conversation. Let us know your overall thoughts of Taxi Driver and Fable. What do you think, Taxi Driver, overall? Uh, overall, it's a great film. It's a, a great character study, like you said. Not only of the main character, Bickle, but like of society as a whole. Um, and it's very... Um, you, like you said, you got to kind of pay attention to a lot of things, a lot of things going on in there um, that if you really look in, it, it, it's trying to say a lot of things. Um, love the performances. Like you said, um, uh, De Niro is amazing. You know, he, he's, he's fantastic. You, you go from feeling sorry for him to feeling like, oh, he's a psychopath. He's completely nuts. <laughs> he does it so brilliantly. Um yeah, no, this is a classic. You know, sometimes I get a little intimidated by movies like this because they're like super classic. And yeah. it's like, I don't know if this thing's going to go over my head because I know there's a lot in here. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know if I'm, I'm really going to get it, but you get it. And it's brilliant. By the end, you, you, you totally understand what it's about or what it's trying to say, especially with that last scene with the, with the lady. Um, so, yeah, no, love this movie. Classic, man. Absolutely. All right, Brooks, this was your first time watching Taxi Driver. I am very curious to hear what you had to think about it. Well, I mean, it is it is certainly, I mean, an interesting movie. It's one of those movies that I watch and I'm like, damn, things really haven't changed that much over, <laughs> over the years, really. Right. It's like, you know, this is a Not thing only. that, you know, people are talking about now that, like, you know, this kind of alienated dude. And it's like, it, it's, it's not a new thing. It's something that's always that's been around, like, you know, as long as society has existed, it seems. But yeah, it is definitely like a fascinating movie. Like, uh, it draw it draws you in, you know, even it, it is very, it is kind of very grim and very, like, you know, it, it can feel kind of oppressive at times. But that's, you know, that's kind of just part of like, you know, getting in, you know, getting behind into the, you know, kind of the character's head, I guess, in a way. But yeah, like overall, Pretty good movie. Pretty good. Overall, pretty good movie. Also, a first time <laughs> watching Taxi Driver is Verno. I'm curious, man. What do you think about this film? Uh, I loved it. I, it was one of those things. Like I saw it on the list, and it's always been on my list of movies that I wanted to watch, and just for whatever reason, never got around to. And then when I went to go put it on, I'm a little bit nervous, kind of like what Fable's saying. It's always nerve wracking to inter to try and break down a classic like this. And then the other thought is like, I hope I like this movie. Robbie's going to be like, why the hell right. you come on to talk about this classic yeah. and you didn't like it? <laughs> so luckily, I, you know, it's a pretty easy movie to like. So I, I loved it. I love Scorsese just like just about everybody. And I was expecting it to be even more like uh, to feel more dated and less like polished. And it's it's less polished than Goodfellas and, you know, some of the stuff right. that came after it. But it's still pretty polished for 1976. And uh, of course, like Fable, you, I love a character study. I love something that's just it's kind of simple. Like that. It's just kind of just focused right. on this dude in this city and this era and then the vibe of it. The atmosphere of the movie is crazy. The cinematography is phenomenal. So it's uh, I love the New Yorkness of it, too. I love movies that are set in 70s and 80s New York. This is something about the way it looks and the cabs and all that. So uh, I loved it. Yeah, it was, you know, obviously it's a top notch. I see why it's on like top 100 movies of all time lists and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And some, I was thinking when I was rewatching it this time, if you guys have ever seen the Nicolas Cage Scorsese film, Bringing Out the Dead, a lot of similar vibes. But instead of a taxi driver, it's a it's a paramedic who hasn't saved anybody's life in like months and months and months. And he's just losing it slowly. Right. And it's way crazy. And it's Nicolas Cage. So that's wild. Um, I absolutely love this film. I think it's great. It does capture New York as a character as well. And it does kind of have that that vibe to it. It almost, I saw, I, I was watching, I was listening to somebody talk about this and they mentioned that it starts out, you think you're watching a horror film at first, right? And it's, yeah, it's not as polished as something like Goodfellas, but for, like Scorsese is so damned brilliant at filmmaking. There's so many like camera movements and little things that he's doing. And the reason why he's doing what he's doing is really exceptional to me. Jelani, you probably like us grew up on this film, right? What'd you think about it on this three watch and overall? 
You don't know what it's like to be the bad man. <laughs> to be the sad man. Yeah, that's what I think. It's it's one of those movies that like I've only watched once. It, it, it's like that 12 years of slave for me. I can only watch it one time and be like, I'm good. <laughs> We're good. But I watched it on this rewatch. I watched it, oh gosh, it's been years since I've seen it. But I remember how gritty it was, how cringy it could be. It has its moments where I'm just like, Travis, no, no, dog. Just sit down, man. Like, get some rest, man. Just lay down and get some sleep, man. It's okay. You don't you don't have to keep popping that no dose and driving all night, like eight, seven days a week, and sometimes eight the way he feels. It's just he, he it's like he's slowly breaking down. And he, he seems like an okay guy at the beginning. And then over time, it's just like his mind is just gone. And it's it, 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 I, I think he was a normal dude. I think he was a normal dude. And he had PTSD. And he just, it, you know, he was in the Vietnam War. And he thought that it was a good idea to, you know, just drive all the time since he couldn't sleep because he always thought about Vietnam. So, you know, and it, it, it shows a lot of different things. Like, we, we're getting to the themes, but this movie is is so beautiful. It tells such a great story about just a breakdown of madness. It's just how, just a lack of sleep and just thinking that you, you can rule the world will, will get you what, what it will get you. And I, I really enjoyed all the characters. Everybody in this in this film, I think, did a brilliant job. I think Scorsese is he's a brilliant director. I mean, I, I love most of the things he's done. I'm not really I'm a, I'm a huge fan of The Departed. Uh, still, um, I can still watch that movie and just be like, oh, it's long as crap. Let's keep watching it. You know, he's got uh, Goodfellas is is one of my favorite gangster films of all time. Um, De Niro, of course, is nailing it. Like you, like he's supposed to. Uh, it's, it's, it's everything about it. I mean, it's a classic. It's a classic for a reason. And of course, like you said before, Robbie, uh, New York is a character in this movie. It's dark and it's gritty. It reminds me a lot of the French Connection too. It, just the way the seventies were, the way the way that it was just set up. It, it's just you know, it was a dirty time. It was a dirty crime ridden yeah. city. It's, it's raw. Everything it was raw. very not raw. Trying to cover nothing up. Yeah, yeah. They're showing the cracks I mean, and everything. Just like twelve-year-old Jodie Foster, like really, you know. And you're just, she's just in this bad situation, but it's New York City, and no one cares. Like the cops don't care. Hashtag, you know, fuck the police. But it's just, <laughs> it, it, they don't do anything now. So why, why would they help anyone? You know, through this, Harvey Cartel is fucking amazing too. It's just uh, things like little stuff I see in the movie, little p people, places, you know, things that happen in this movie are just so clean. I mean, overall, I think it's still a fantastic movie. I still think it holds up. Um, the second time I've watched it, it's, I still cringed a little bit. I had to like watch the scene where he goes to the uh, to the campaign office and screaming Sybil Shepherd again, and it still bothers me for some reason. It's just so because you know I like love stories, but. You know, this is an anti-love story, and he totally screws it up. But it's just, it's just one of those scenes that just makes me like, I gotta fast forward through it. I'm just gonna watch it again later. And I watched it again later, and I was like, oh, it still cringes me out. So it's still it's a great, still a great film. I love it. I love Word. it. Word. I, uh, I would also dare to say this is the best Punisher movie that's ever been done. Mm. Yep, <laughs> I agree. I mean, this is what I want a Punisher or origin story to look like, like Punisher Year One. You know, parent, you know, like Maria and the kids, they've been killed. We just start, right. you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I got to get every muscle tight. I got to do it in my exercise and all that stuff. And that's a really cool thing that's compelling about that character of Travis is we get this monologue throughout the movie where he's just telling us kind of what he's feeling, but he contradicts what he says with his actions throughout the entire movie. Like he talks about the scum and the filth of this society, but where does he spend all of his time? At the, in the, scum of the building. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's in also a dirty like, ass apartment. Right. Yeah. And it's like he seeked this <laughs> out in particular. It's almost like he seeked out, like it's almost like you think he set the beginnings of this mission start before the movie even starts rolling, right? Yeah. Because We're he's already right in the middle. Yeah, he's looking for a job yeah. to work right. at night. 
and he'll go anywhere. He'll do anything. He'll work any night and all that. Like he's setting himself up for this. And it is a story about isolation and a lot of other things. And and we'll get into that. But this movie, of course, does not work without a great cast. It has an amazing cast. Babel, you're from New York. You get first pick. Who you want to talk about? Oh, okay. Um, hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'll probably go with uh, Harvey Keitel's pimp. Um, I Gord. saw that character. Gord. Yeah. He was a weird stretch. I love yeah. weird stretches sometimes. Yeah, he was a total weird stretch. I mean, the way he dressed and everything. He was um, a pimp. He looked like a pimp. pimp. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and just, just his whole, you know, Travis is crazy. Everybody's fucking crazy in this movie. Really. I mean, really think about it. Everybody's kind of nuts. And, uh, Harvey's just another one of those, man. You know, he, he, he's talking about 12 year old girls and, you know, how it's so good to have that, you know, and you want to talk the about the time. You want to talk about the cringy uh, scene when he's like yeah. talking to dancing her, so we're gonna her, dancing her kid. Like, yeah, well, that was what I was gonna say next. He goes from that yeah. to to like, telling her the most romantic, sweetest thing that any girl would want to hear, and he's doing it so well. Like he knows how to play. He's, he's freaking nuts. He's a, he's a head job, you know. So, but everybody is. But yeah, I highlight Harvey Cartel's pimp man. Love it. We're stretching. He's great because you see him in so many of these yeah. movies where he's like smooth or he's like uh like you know gangster or he's like he got it together or he's going crazy and in this one he's like you never seen him in a role like this it's like watching Gary Oldman in True Romance <laughs> right. he's, yeah. like, exactly. he's like he's like exactly. he's just like come on baby man what's going on man it's just yeah. it's just a whole it's a whole other kind of side of Harvey Keitel I I I, I yeah. kind of like awesome. him. just a little bit he's definitely a douchebag anyway Brooks what's yeah. the character you want to highlight. It's not in that much, but but Peter Boyle's character is it the wizard? The yes. wizard. Like I like I love, I love I love I love Peter Boyle. Like you know, Young Frankenstein is one of my favorite movies of yeah. all time, and like he's so good in this movie, man. He's like because he's like uh, he's the the veteran New Yorker, you know. He's he's the guy who's, who's who's seen everything, you know. He's seen the best and the worst, you know. He's been there, and like you know, he sees this young dude who seems to be like, you know, having a hard time. And he kind of like, you know, he tries to reach out to him a little bit, you know, like, you know, things, you get used to it, you know, you just, you just gotta like, you know, he's trying to, he's like a, a mentor in a way, but uh, it, it seems like it, he didn't, his, his advice wasn't heated as much as, you know, it could have been, but. Well, uh, an interesting thing about that is he doesn't give him good advice. Like this guy is like the one time that you see. He's basically that- just like, just keep going. He's like, yeah, you know, you, you he goes, what he says that like a man takes a job and all of a sudden and become and that's what he is. Yeah. Just you are what you are, and then like just leaves. And then he's like, I guess I'll no, go. Oh, yeah, he, he had the best <laughs> line. He had one of the best lines in the movie because he was like, That was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He's like, Well, what do you expect? I'm a cabbie. <laughs> yeah, what do I know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Brooks, you're right, he does play that role really well. What about you, Verna? What's a performance you want to highlight? Well, I, I was not expecting uh, De Niro to be to be available. I had a bunch of small little ones I was going to go with. I'm almost intimidated to <laughs> to even speak on De Niro, but I'll go with him. He's obviously he's incredibly interesting. And Rob, you touched on like the subtlety of it, like the way that you kind of learn about him. There, this is all show don't tell. Well, I guess besides the little bit of a his his inner monologue that's kind of like showing you what he's thinking and all that but the the subtlety of his performance he's n- almost never over the top even you hear people do like are you talking to me are you talking to me like you know they get so into it yeah. that's not the way he does it he's very very chill about it and like even that scene that you were just talking about fable with wizard when he's say it talking about I'm, I'm i'm having some crazy thoughts like mm. you could see someone having these crazy eyes when he's talking about that, but he's just real subtle. You got to read between the lines to be like, dude is having some crazy thoughts. Yeah, I believe <laughs> it, but uh, <laughs> he's great. I love when they do the Mohawk. He just looks insane after that. Cause that's another thing going into this movie. That's the picture I have in my head is like, Oh, this is Robert De Niro with that Mohawk. I'm just picturing him driving down in a cab, like just mowing people down. But the whole <laughs> movie is more subtle than that. I just do this something crazy was going to happen with him. But the way that they pace it out to what they put in your head about what he's going to do to what ends up happening with the character in in the end is uh, 
is pretty crazy, man. He looking at him and that that scene where he's talking to the CIA agent and just that smile that he's got on his face, it, it probably would have diminished his career. But like, it's a shame that we never got a Joker role out of Robert De Niro because he's so goddamn crazy looking with his smile that uh, it's still like charming at the same time. But yeah, I mean, he's Robert De Niro. This is one of the reasons why we all know his name, and I can, uh, you know, you can see why. Yeah, absolutely. I love that scene too because he's got his guns, right? And he's talking to the secrets. He's like, Oh, I always wanted to be you. He's like, Yeah, I'll write down your name. He gives him fake names. Like, you, you get the idea that he feels like, you know, like, I don't know, man. In that moment, like, this is such a weird moment. Like, he's so, I think that's the happiest Awkward. he is in the entire movie. Right. <laughs> because he, he thinks he's, he's like outdone him, I guess, in a way. Right. Oh, the other thing I want to say about it, yeah, that kind of goes along with it. He thinks he's way smarter than he is. He thinks he's right. the one that's going to walk yeah. into Sybil Shepherd and save her and explain to what she's doing wrong. Same thing with Jodie Foster's character. Like he yeah. uh, he sees himself as the savior and the one with the moral compass and knows what's wrong with the city and what's wrong with the whole world. But he is a part of what's wrong with the city and the right. world. So, and then just to add it in complexity of well, it's not his fault. It's post traumatic post traumatic stress and he was in the military so that just an added layer of complexity to uh to his or character was he right yeah that's a good point that's, that's a good question yeah he does have that gnarly wound on his back but remember he was working for the government doing government work important government. exactly he like, to be a he's service. an unreliable narrator and right. yeah. because <laughs> when he writes the letter to his parents he lies about his entire life about everything and he's right. The, the narration that we're hearing is the journal that he's writing, the note he's writing mm -hmm. for this event that he thinks he's not going to survive through. Mm -hmm. Right. And so he's lying about that, too, because he's saying, you know, I'm going to live clean. No more junk food. He never stops eating junk food, never stops drinking throughout the movie. He drinks pop all pills, pop and yeah, pills. He's, pills. And he's so talking about like people with these, these junkies. Dude's a junkie, you know, yeah. and like <laughs> that's, that's something that's so cool about this movie. And. I think it's amazing. Jelani, what's a performance you want to highlight? Bro, I don't know if this was yours, but I'm going to so take it. It's freaking Scorsese. Scorsese. <laughs> God, damn it. That was mine. You I know. Like, nobody's going to pick Scorsese. I, know. I was going to. The second, this is how messed up it was, though. I was watching it again, and I remember the scene, but I didn't remember who the guy was. And I was like, holy crap, that's Scorsese. Holy crap, I love this scene. It's it's one of my it's it's my favorite scene in the whole movie to be honest, like him getting in the car. And by the way, and I, I take that because I, I am also an Uber and Lyft driver. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, I I, I, get, I know I know Bickle, uh, it, but not that not to that level. I'm just saying when you get you get that crazy fare. Sometimes you get that crazy fare that gets in the car. And, brother. But, Sorry. Yeah, brother, brother. <laughs> but uh it's it, it, when you get that crazy fair that's just like stay in the car. Don't don't uh, just I didn't tell you leave. I didn't tell you cut the meter off. I didn't tell you do anything. You just sit in the car. You do what you want to do. And I love I love his commanding performance. And of course, he's a great actor because A, I was scared of him. And I, I, if I was in the car, if, if Scorsese got in the car and did the same thing to me. I acted the same way Travis Bickle did, except I would have told on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> stitches get stitches, but if he gonna say he gonna keep murder somebody in my in my earshot, you're done, son. I'll be in court for that one. I'll be like, it's Scorsese. It's that guy right there. I'm gonna kill his wife. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot my wife with a 44 Magnum. Shoot her in the face. You ever seen that happen in, in someone's in the face? That's a good point like, in the movie, too, because yeah, that's the first that's gun he, he asks for when he goes right. to buy the guns. Because mm -hmm. he knows he knows that gun does damage. And it was a hand cannon. But it, uh, the, the, the his performance is so haunting. And the fact that he's a director in that in that scene. And there, there there's actually a thing. What, I also work at call center, but they have these different tropes of people that work or that the, the types of phone calls and they, they, they try to pit us like they want us to be a director, a thinker. Um, I forgot the other two, but there are two other ones. And we're all a different type of those people who like to direct, who like to tell you what's going on, what they want done right now. 
and his character as a, and as a director, he is a director. He is just one of those people. Um, I think Bickle is more so of a thinker, but he is insane. <laughs> but in, in the car, that whole scene is very tense. He he directs. I like how he uh, Scorsese tells him to look at the window. See the see the light first. He starts. See the light. I want you to look at the light, and I want you to follow it. And he's like, I want you to follow. It. And the camera, by the way, is following what he's directing. And I, I think it's so brilliant the fact that he's a character in this film. He's telling Bill to look in the window to see his wife, and it's just a clean, continuous shot of what he's talking about and what happens in the film or as it's being directed to him. And I think that's the cleanest scene in the whole film. It's just, it's scary, <laughs> it's haunting. It starts Bickle on his path to becoming a vigilante and, and, and it's, it's it's so beautiful. I love it. I don't know. He's 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 my favorite character in that film. And I know you you, you want to talk about it, Robbie, you talk about it. But, no, that's but. fine. I was just, you said everything uh, I was going to say, so. Darn. I guess you got a bunch of acting offers. At least you let us say it, man. At least you let us say it. So I give you credit. Yep. All right, I'll go with Betsy then, Sybil Shepard. I uh, (laughs) like her in the film. I think she does a really great job. I think she's adorable in the film. I think I love the, the, when her and Travis first meet, like there's something genuine there. There's a genuine interest. Dude fucks it up. Dude fucks it up really, (laughs) really bad. And you trying to tell me he didn't think that that's what you do? Like you don't oh, take the date. girl to the you know your first movie date to a fucking cum soaked porn theater like basically that's you know well apparently he, he like I guess like a lot of couples went to the porn theaters and he probably just saw a bunch of couples there and he's like oh this is I guess this is where people take their dates that's why the seventh or eighth date that's why yeah. porn made home video explode because now mm-hmm. everybody can be a pervert in the privacy of their own homes right so there you go that's a line from X anyway um. <laughs> Which is a great film. I'll go. Yeah, Sybil Shepherd. Also, quick shout out to Jodie Foster as uh, Iris. Really She's awesome. convincing role, and and not done in an exploitative way, but done in a very real way. Um, let's talk about the style and structure of this film. I'm going to repeat a lot of what I said for my overall thoughts because the movie is the style. The movie is the structure. The movie is the story, which is hypnotizing, mesmerizing. That camera movement that Scorsese uses, that he uses in all of his films, right? Scorsese, in the 1986 Criterion uh, Commentary for Taxi Driver, said that what he's trying to do in this film in particular, and with a lot of his films, with the way he moves and operates the camera, is he's trying to show, he says, he's a thinker, he's quick, he, his focus shifts and goes back and forth. He's trying to capture that. He's trying to capture the unique way that he perceives new york from that time visually and so for instance when we get introduced to sybil shepherd not when we get introduced to her but when travis is introduced travis's perspective crazy busy campaign office and it's this wide shot that just slowly goes in but not at the not at the usual angle and goes straight to her that's him his focus going right in the way that the camera will very quickly move A lot of people don't do quick camera movements like that. And when they do, they look very cheesy, especially when they're in the 70s with their zooms and all that shit. So the camera movement in this is top notch. Some of the best in the Scorsese film, I think. It's got this hazy, dreamlike quality that comes from Chapman's cinematography, comes from what Scorsese's trying to say about the atmosphere and vibe of New York City. The story is incredibly layered. It's a layered character study uh, about isolation, about contradiction, um, it's the best Punisher movie ever. I got that note right there. And the unreliable narrator thing. And you got to piece that together. You got to pay attention to what you see visually and juxtaposition that against what he's telling us to know that it's bullshit. It's a lie. This dude does not have a sense of self. So he definitely can't find a sense of self within the core group of society. Right? So I think it's stylistically, structurally, story-wise, just brilliant. What about you, Fable? Style, structure. Uh, yeah, like I said earlier, it's a raw film. Uh, it's one of the things I love about 70 cinematography <clears throat> is that they don't try to uh, butter nothing up. They don't repaint the walls white. They don't clean the floors. I mean, there's a scene where he's walking down the sidewalk and all you see is garbage on the damn sidewalk. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> he, he, he captured it. 
captured it. You feel the grime. You feel the dirt. You feel everything that he's feeling. I can't breathe. I get, I get headaches, you know, looking at this stuff. You look at the pimps, how they show the pimps and their bad looking faces. They're like, oh, mean mugging and stuff. And like you said, he's perceiving these things. Um, he's a bit of a racist, right? You can tell. He's just by the visual. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. A little bit. But um, it's, it is, it's a paranoia. But it's all it's not there. visually. It's yeah. all conveyed visually. Never said, never, matter of fact, he owes a black guy $5. So he asked the guy for five bucks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you can tell deep down inside he's got these feelings. Um, so, so really stylistically is what we're talking about. Yeah, this movie is very stylish. I love it. And uh, structure, yeah, man. You hit the nail on the head with the narration, the way he narrates. Uh, Vernal touched on it earlier. He's not a smart man. He's actually pretty dumb. And the way he reads and the way he talks and the way he writes is pretty basic, pretty simple. Um, and he even, the way he says reading it back, it's like he can't even read his own writing. It's, it, it's, it's weird in that way. And like Robbie said, you got to pick up on it. So this is a movie that stylistically and structurally, you have to pay attention. You know, um, so much, so much. The, the political stuff. I'm not a political guy. He's got campaign shit all over his house. Yeah, I mean, it's just a bunch of this stuff. So yeah, style and structure, awesome. Absolutely, and and you know, we were saying like you got to pay attention. What's so captivating about this film is it makes you pay attention, and that's what's yeah. so incredible to me about how they tell the story visually. What about you, Brooks? What do you think about the style and structure? Well, I think it's. it's I mean, it's. it's... It, the style is obviously very good, but it, the, the interesting thing about this movie is it's like it's a story about a dude who's trying to become a hero by basically by finding a dragon to slay in a way, you know? It's like a guy who's like, he feels like he needs something, he needs to, you know, he needs to be fighting something, you know? He wants to be like, you know, a hero, so he finds like the fucking worst people in his eyes that he can be around so he can find, he can like, you know, prepare himself to, you know, to, to fight the evil that he so desperately wishes, you know, existed for him to fight. It's, it's, it's like this idea, you know, that people get like, you know, they want to be a hero, but, you know, real life isn't like that. You know, there aren't just villains waiting around every corner for you to, to fight. Like real life isn't that simple. It's, it's like a very simplistic kind of philosophy that I think, I think people get caught up in and like, it, it can it sometimes ends up like this where like somebody will, you know, thinking they're a hero, they will go out and they will do something. They will hurt somebody. Some oftentimes people who have nothing to do, you know, with, uh, with their grievances and, you know, it's just kind of a sad state of affairs, but, uh, that's, that's like, that's, that's, I don't think many movies before, before this one, like would have addressed like, you know, a, a hero right. like that, a hero who is, who is, you know, only a hero in his own mind, really. Yeah, it's kind of a bold move. And there is this Western motif that I saw pointed out in something I was listening to earlier where he sees himself as the cowboy. And there are moments where characters call him a cowboy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Sport, for instance, has, even though he's dressed like a pimp, there's this Native American connotation to the way that he looks, right? And then by the end of the film, to kind of show that he's crossed that Travis has crossed over the, the line. He's got the Mohawk, right. Mm -hmm. Which were known as some of the more vicious at the time or whatever. Right. So like all these kind of ideas and connotations are there, even through an experience of cinema and referencing like cinema uh, archetypes and symbols. Right. And I think that's absolutely a fantastic thing to throw into it. So maybe there are some comparisons to other things, but this is the first one for sure where there was, nothing really redeemable about the hero of the film. And he still does wind up the hero, which the ending is, is an interesting bit. A lot of people, I always felt like it was a dream or in his head because we see Sybil Shepard in the, uh, in the rear view. We, they don't, you don't really see her like with him yeah. on the screen or whatever, but there's a lot of that in this movie where they intentionally set De Niro out of frame from everybody else to show how much of an outsider he feels like to show how much of, how, how isolated he has allowed himself to be because it is a, a self-made isolation, right? Uh, speaking of self-made uh, isolation and self-abuse, Verno, what about <laughs> style and structure? What do you think? To describe my twenties. Uh, I think they're both uh, obviously excellent. The structure to me, especially watching it 
the first time and not really knowing what kind of movie it was going to be. I really enjoyed like there was a moment when when he goes in to speak with Betsy and he's being pretty normal. I was almost starting to get disappointed. I'm like, ah, this is going to be like kind of a normal romantic kind of a movie. Like it started to, you didn't you you thought that that was going to be the movie, him chasing this girl. And that lasts about five minutes. Like he's took her to the porn shortly after that. And instantly the, the whole tone of the movie changes at that point. And that's the same time they trickle in uh, Jodie Foster's character. And when he picks up, he sees Jody, and then he sees the the guy that's running for president. And both those things, they're not obvious, but you'd know right away if you're paying attention the road that it's going to lead to. So it's just interesting. The way, you know that you, you assume that he's going to assassinate this guy right away, but they don't start alluding to the guns and all that for quite a while. But uh, to the style-wise, it was funny. I'm watching it, and I'm thinking about Tarantino. I'm like I'm realizing how much Tarantino is influenced by Scorsese with the the way that it pans down to the twenty and then back up to him that and that through line with the twenty dollar bill that's one of my favorite bits of the movie. Yeah. But then, but then mm-hmm. in that, in that, uh, that uh, commentary com- that you were mentioning, Robbie Scorsese mentions Mario Bava, and then I'm like, God damn, fuck! All roads lead back to Bava. Like Bava is one of the most influential <laughs> people in the history of cinema, especially realizing how much Scorsese influenced him and how much Scorsese or vice versa and then how much Scorsese has influenced everybody so it's like uh, and I would yeah, say yeah. it goes back further right and it goes into Kurosawa and it goes into Orson mm-hmm. Welles yeah. right? and even Frank Capra I would say mm-hmm. to a lesser extent but. right I say it right like I know what the hell you're talking about I didn't know those last couple <laughs> of years, but, but right right yeah I'm, I'm with you <laughs> Capra did a wonderful life it's a wonderful life uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much what I got. I just thought it was it was so masterfully done to use an yeah. over uh, overused term. Just the, the subtlety of the whole thing. Was it definitely is masterful. It's a classic, and it's nice to that. It's nice when you know a movie's supposed to be a classic, and you finally watch it, and you're not let down. Right. You know, because sometimes that happens. Right. Totally. What about you, Jelani? Speaking of being let down, um, what do you think about the style and structure of this film? Well, I wasn't let down by this film, but uh... I'm saying we're let down by you, but that's okay. Oh. That's man, man, I go. But uh, <laughs> go ahead. Love you. There's man. um. First of all, I, I don't think he was too much of a racist fable because Bickle was hitting on the black girl, uh, in the porn theater, theater trying to get her. Yeah, name. but 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 you he, know I know that. I know what you're Those talking guys, about. You know what I'm talking. Trust about. me. Here's the other thing. Here's the thing. He, he, he is definitely he's definitely scared. Of black men in that city, right? Yes, yeah. he is yeah. definitely. I mean, they threw stuff in his car, so I mean, remember, you know. he's a racist, but he's a man first, right? So <laughs> racism kind of takes second place. To, you yeah. know, there yeah. are plenty of racists that were uh, with black women right. back in the eighteen hundreds, right? Exactly. Yeah, he's right. A man first, but yeah, but so there was there was that, and then also, can we not address the elephant in the room of the uh, how two dollars buys everything? <laughs> um, that you want, and he was like, I want that, I want some of that, and popcorn, and I want to get one of those. You got Juju's, you know, I know Juju's, that's fine. Let me get that. And she was like, two dollars. <laughs> he was just like, All right, <laughs> <laughs> lays it out. I'm like, Okay, you got but a yeah, lot of shit for two dollars, man. That was ridiculous. He did, you did. I was getting mad. Yeah, I was if getting you ordered that in movie theater today, they'd be like, That'd be two hundred dollars, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, style and structure all together though, it it looks great. Um, it's shot perfectly. Look, my my favorite shot in the scene in, in this movie is the scene right after he's done the killing and he's in there with Jodie Foster in the room and she's like crying in the room, but the cops have already pointed their guns at him, and then he does the to his head, and like they do that panning shot that's overhead. It sees like him on the couch and he's leaned back and Jody Foster's on the side on the couch crying and there's dead body here. And like these cops are just ho- still holding their guns, but it's all above shot. It's an all above shot and it goes back and it's just, it, it, it's so, I love that shot. I have no clue. I was like, wow, is this the end of the movie? I was like, of course it's not. I got to get to the dream sequence slash ending slash epilogue. And like you don't know if he died. It, did he die? And then he's just dreaming. Traitor, this is his last dream before the end. 
Scorsese and Schrader say that 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 inning is real. I okay. hate that they said that because I I yeah. was curious what you guys all thought because I thought the same thing. It was a dream. I hate that. Yeah, Scorsese says that. I, mean, I like that Iris got to go back home. I like all the I like the resolution of all the things that happened. I loved it. But the thing is, I was like, oh, in this movie, he should just be dead. We should have gone back to him in a mohawk, and he's just like, Ugh. yeah, you know. Well, I, there's a piece of me that thought, is this a cop out ending? To give this dark, grim film like a happy ending, but like happy ending. what Scorsese and them are saying is that the point is you can try to be a hero for all the wrong reasons, but the when you do when when heroes happen and they capture the national interest, it is the most random shit. Like yeah. we know through the experience of this movie, through the character study being done, he is not a hero. Not at all. He is a very sick he is individual. A very sick person. But society yeah. then does accept him. Not when he's crying out for help, not when he's in need, but when he crosses the line. Right. And then, and then also, just the, this is the last point, and I keep forgetting, I was going to mention this um, before, but it, it inspired John Hinckley to like try and assassinate Reagan. Um, Scorsese said he stopped filmmaking. He was like, he didn't want to do that because he felt like that invoked, like, uh, you know, it, it gave the rise of this kid who wanted to be a hero. Cause like, remember Travis Bickle's whole whole thing was he was gonna make this thing and then shoot the presidential candidate <laughs> or stab him or whatever he wanted to do. He was gonna kill him. And like, I don't know why. I don't know what triggered it. I why I tried to watch it again to like piece why he was he was like getting there. Cause like he actually thought that this guy was gonna like, it's I really want to vote for you. And because then of the like, rejection, you know, that's the politics of Palantine. Like, yeah. is he left wing? Is he right wing? Like, there's no, they don't no, say. It's not clear. It's not clear. And it, what, what do you think about Wherefore? Because you're getting it from Travis. And Travis doesn't care about politics. So it didn't matter who he was. He's his a politician. Obsession, he had to go. His obsession is with killing the father yeah. figures of the two women in his life, which are Iris mm. and uh, Betsy. Yeah. Right? And he fails to kill the one. So then he goes and kills the other one, which right. is Fort. Right. And it's it's so it, it's so dramatic. It's beautiful. Like I said, it, and it's beautifully shot that way. Scorsese is a it, he's a master. He's an absolute master at, at his craft. And he tells he tells the story visually all the way through. Like I said, even the end credits are hazy. It's just just haze. And you don't know if it you know, if it is or if it isn't there. Things things are there. And it's 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 very like it's the unreliable narrator, but it's also the unreliable scenes that you see in this. Like you're watching it, but are you watching it? Is it that? And we were talking about the you know Civil Shepherd in the in the rearview mirror. Is she there? Kind of situations. And you know she, he did that date. No, still last thing. He he did that date. She don't want to talk to him no more. And all of a sudden now she hopping in his cab. She know that's his cab. <laughs> She knows she wants to talk to him now. He's a hero he's a now. Hero. And I'm like, I mean, he was he he, he kind of made sense on the first date. He did mess up on his second date, but eventually he was gonna mess up regardless. I think he was gonna do something wrong to begin with, to, oh, you yeah. know, for them not to be together. But at, even at the same time, man, if, if you just got some sleep, if you just like sat down and and like had a pillow and just slept a little bit. And just thought about happy thoughts. Take some melatonin or something, or so something that don't is not hand performing, and, and get you some warm milk or something, and take a hot bath. Do do something for yourself, no, son, son. <laughs> and just, just just sit down. I'm not just talking to Travis Bickle. I'm talking to one other person in here. Just, just calm down. You'll be fine. That's it. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I love it. Jelani's like, man, I just, he's watching Taxi Driver. He's like, he just needs a bath, some warm milk. Like, that's all this man needs. That's all this man needs. Shoulder rub. That's <laughs> it. He'll be fine. I'm serious. Yeah, I talk, I need to talk to somebody about your problems. He needs to talk yeah. to somebody about then, his problems. And then when you do reach out to talk to someone, don't, don't, when someone reaches out to talk to you, just don't be like, well, you know, you get a job and that's who you are. Just, just put your head down and fucking do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not that guy. All right. Good, good insight, but not, not that. We're about to be talking about the music, but before we do that, I just want to run down a list of some of my favorite film scores. Taxi Driver, right? It's Alive, the Larry Cohen film, is one of my favorites. Uh, how about Psycho, Cape Fear, the original Cape Fear? Uh, 
How about The Man Who Knew Too Much, that Hitchcock film? How about Vertigo, right? That's a great one. What about, I absolutely love the, the, the score for The Day the Earth Stood Still, and I love the score for Citizen Kane. Guess what all these scores have in common? It's the same damn person, Bernard Herman. He is literally one of the best yeah. composers of all time. His career started with Citizen Kane, and Taxi Driver is one of the last movies he did. He did Day the Earth Stood Still. He did Psycho. He did so many iconic uh, scores. And what's amazing is if you know these scores, they're all different. They're all different. This one is a very... There's no Danny Elfman going on. I'll tell you what. Next time I listen, or next time I read Blue and Green by Ron V and uh, Anand R.K., I'm listening to this soundtrack <laughs> because this is a haunting jazz score that I find very unsettling. It captures something. It captures monotonous or monotony. It captures that kind of kind of slow, dra like that slow draw of just being up nonstop. I don't know if any of you guys have ever developed uh, a, a problem with like uppers or cocaine or anything like that. But like when you're up for days, world is different. Reality is different. Like it's, it's like the walls start fucking right. And so the music, they start fucking visuals, how yeah, the music, yeah, the every, yeah. Reality starts fucking. And that's you know, when reality fucks. That's when you're fucked anyway. But music does a great job in conjunction with those visuals to give you that dreamlike sequence. Scorsese says, Good films get you in that zone in between sleep and awake, which is kind of like a trance state, like people that go into meditation or, or that's what you're seeking. That's one of the reasons why I think I love music. I mean, movies is because you do when you get zoned in, there's no outside world. You're in this dream. Right. And he's trying to amplify that in this film to lull you into that state, because that is Travis's constant state of being is in that like in between oh restlessness and tired and just all of that stuff. What do you think about the music in the film, babe? I got to be honest with you. I, I don't like this soundtrack too much. I just don't like the, the music. But I do recognize its brilliance in the way it's used to storytell. Like you said, it's a jazz soundtrack. It, it, it's, you know, jazz can get crazy. There's no rules sometimes in jazz. And that's how this is. So when the frantic moments happen, the music gets frantic. And then it calms down. And it, like you said, it has this dreamlike quality. So by the end of the movie, I respected it. I knew what he was doing with it, especially when really crazy stuff happens. They go, the horns will come in. Mm -hmm. like, um, but again, you know, it's just not my, my sounds that I like to listen to, but I respect the character it plays in the movie. So mm -hmm. yeah, great. You know, good score. Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. What about you, Brooks? what do you think about the music? It's uh it's it's quite good. Um, lots of saxophone, of course, and uh, piano. Like it's, it feels like it's kind of like you know, uh, like a jazz lounge almost. Like it's the kind of music you'd expect to be hearing, like if you just walked into like a a jazz, jazz bar or something like that. Like during a bad acid trip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's great. It, it, does, it gives it that very kind of like you know, uh, crime noir feel. You know, that 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 really works. I think. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Vern? Yeah, I mean it's it's great right off the bat. It's it really kind of sets the tone. It's it adds a lot of class to the film. Like it's got a nice it contrasts the sleaziness of the city with this really classy saxophone. I'm always a sucker for sax. And it does it gets dark too. Like even like the opening theme, it's really, really classy. And then it's like it gets really dark and ominous at times too, which kind of is a good, you know, that's what the whole film is is like to a to a degree there's a really good cue the first time we see sybil shepherd this really romantic music kind of comes in and that's just great so uh yeah it, it's phenomenal it's top-notch stuff i will say the the negative bit there is like when he's getting ready like he's ripping off his sleeves and buttoning up his shirt it gets this like brrr, like where they're just running like up and down it sounds like a like a child xylophone or a, or a harp or something like that I don't get it. Like even even I think even after he does the the bang bang thing and it shows that scene outside, it's just like oh my god, this is so tragic. And at that moment, I don't get the music and why they're playing what they're playing. Other than that, I think it's 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 fired. It's really a uh, recognizable and memorable. But that, you you guys know the bits that I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was weird. Other than that, I thought it was. I think great. that's just 1976. 
Right, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jelani? What did you think about the, the music by the great, legendary Bernard Herman? Well, I will say this, uh, just as a preference. I hate jazz. Like, mm. I can't stand it. It's just me so unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I like that, Jelani. Let's, 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 can we hear that again? That's pretty good. <laughs> it sounded just like a jazz song, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, shit, man, calm down. It's okay, dog. Calm down. You need but to get you need, let's get these instruments some warm milk, a hot bath. Yeah. Yeah. Just a warm bath, sit down, talk to it. Just be like, calm down. I guess, I guess Jen, I, I love yeah, I'm a hater. Uh, I'm a professional <laughs> hater, car care member. Um, there's so many things I hate, but there are a lot of things I love, and I, I'm passionate about both. But uh, that being said, this is great music. I, it, it fits this film to a T. It shows the chaotic nature of Travis Bickle. It gives you like his, his mindset, like when he's writing the letter, the music in the background of that was just like, duh, 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 duh. you know, and he's just like trying to talk to his family. And uh, it's just such a different tone from, of course, putting his clothes on and, and, and th that scene at the end uh, that you were talking about, Verno. It's it's a lot of different tones, but they all fit. It works perfectly. Like even the end credits, I love the end credit music, where it's just playing, and it's still that you know kind of kind of sax, that deep sax, and like yeah, and I love Cowboy Bebop. By the way, I will put that in. I love Cowboy Bebop for the for the jazz of it, 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 it making it. As awesome as it is, it made me like jazz for a while. My uncle Doc, who who passed on, uh, he loved jazz and would make me and would play it, make me listen to it all the time. It's almost great. Miles Davis is fantastic. There you go. But you know, and you you get classics in there. Uh, Thelonious Monk. There are, there are a lot of good jazz artists. I just hate jazz. I just, uh, uh, just I, I heard there's nothing wrong with that, man. It. We're not judging. Yeah, you, man. but. No. But that, but that, this music fits very well into each scene. It makes it alive. It's a part of New York City. It makes New York City feel alive and gritty, and just it, it's already gritty. And it's just, oh God, I couldn't live back there. Like if I had gone to New York City back in the seventies, oh my, I don't know what I would have done. Myself. Like <laughs> going to, going to the Bronx uh, and like Brooklyn, yeah. or Harlem, like yes, I was asking. Well, I was like, why? I I was asking Rex and John, because Rex and John, who do the EXP Well, everybody show, over here has PTSD, so I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I was asking Rex and John, who do the show with me on the EXP that we do right before this, because they, mm -hmm. they're up in the, the New Jersey era, area. And mm -hmm. I was like, hey, you guys are old enough. Do you, you remember New York from the 70s? And like Rex told the story that every time you get to New York, you would have to roll up your windows because the smell <laughs> no. was so fucking bad. <laughs> They were like you would get into certain tunnels and you'd have to roll up your windows because, or you die of carbon monoxide poisoning and like, oh felt like just gnarly That's and awful. grimy and nasty. He said the smell was unbearable back in the day in New York City. So I don't yeah, know. I mean they cleaned it up. It's cleaned up now. I've been to New York twice and I really, I mean, I, it's a clean city now. You know, it's fine. I've been all the places and and well, not all the boroughs or anything, but I've been in good spots. And it, it's beautiful now. And I'm like, it's completely different from what, what it was. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't think I would have lived in the 70s, 80s in New York City. I would have found a way to like skip that. And so I'd have got stabbed off the bus. And I just don't think it'd been a good idea. That's it. I just... All right. Nice. I love how the music discussion turned into that. All right. <laughs> this movie's about a lot of stuff. But we got several profound thinkers here tonight. Hmm. Where? So, Fable. What is Taxi Driver about to you? What's it saying to you? Uh, it says a lot of things. This, this movie, I picked up several themes. I mean, you can go into toxic masculinity. You can talk about loneliness. Um, but I think this movie is exactly what Silver Shepherd described Bickle as, a walking contradiction. Everything in this movie mm. is a contradiction. Everything from, mm. from uh, what do you say? Uh, the, uh, Scorsese getting in the cab, right? And Scorsese looking like a nice, well-dressed, well-mannered man. Well, no, he wants to kill his wife <laughs> upstairs. Mm. 
<laughs> and the forty-four is, Magnum uh, with a shooter in the face and the pussy. Yeah. Yep. And the pussy. Everything. <laughs> Everything is a is a contradiction. Everything is uh, opposed to each other. Um, even when you said earlier, when him and her have a genuine moment, right? Opposites attract. I mean that that's what happened there, right? So it's like, um, and these juxtapositions cause perspectives that make everybody think that everybody else is crazy, right? And because that's New York in a nutshell mm-hmm. too. All we talk about is how crazy everybody else is. But how is everybody crazy? We're all crazy then, right? Sybil Shepherd, she's a nice lady, right? No, she, she wanted him when he became famous. She's a jerk. Right. She's a douchebag. Everybody's crazy. Everybody's contradictory in this movie. And everybody's crazy. I mean, you see when he goes to, I don't know where he goes, but there's a guy screaming down the block, I'm going to kill that bitch. I'm going to kill that bitch. Mm. <laughs> That's crazy. Right, everybody, <laughs> and but everybody's not nuts, right? So it's like, because Travis does think of things that people think of when they're not around other people. You know what I'm saying? Let's be honest here. There's some deep, yeah. there's some honest thoughts there, right? Um, so yeah, I think I think everything is about is is what Sybil Shepherd said. She said he's a walking. I think everything in his movie is a contradiction, even though that is not the only thing. You can draw so much. But I'm going to go with that one because I think usually there is always a character that tells you what the movie's about if you're paying attention, right? Yeah. And that was, I think she was that right there at that moment. So I'm gonna oh, go you're with right, man. The, the contradictory yeah. nature of Travis is such yeah. a big deal. And just the contradictory nature of everybody else of, of that city. You're right. Spot on. Great job. I'm very impressed, Fable. What about you, Brooks? <laughs> What's this movie speaking to you? I think this movie is a lot about uh, the, like, um, the feeling of powerlessness that we have, you know, and how it affects affects us and how it can, how it can affect us, you know, is we we always have this idea, like I was saying, for you know, like just we need to slay the dragon, we need to save the princess, you know, these ideas of like how we prove ourselves, how to prove that we're not, that you know, that we're strong, that we're not afraid, you know. And like society puts so many constraints on us, you know, we're not allowed to act on like our more base impulses. And, you know, that can make you feel like, you know, like you don't have any power, like you don't have any, like, and, you know, sometimes some people just can't handle that, you know, they can't handle that feeling of, you know, powerlessness and not being able to like, you know, they they feel like they can't express themselves. And, you know, it's a sad thing, but, you know, sometimes it happens and people like will just, they'll just snap and, you know. And they'll lash out and just just to feel, you know, like they have some kind of like uh, some kind of say in their own life, you know, like that they're not just, you know, sheep or pawns or drones, you know, just going about a, a meaningless existence. But, you know, in the ways like these these ideas of, you know, saving the princess and slaying the dragon is like they're just they're just dumb stories, you know, it's just ways. We, we amuse ourselves by thinking about, you know, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do this? But like, you know, you, it's got to, you got to learn to compartmentalize, I guess, you know, reality from fantasy. And that's like a thing that a lot, not everybody can do, you know, some people just can't accept, you know, life for what it is. And uh, sometimes that leads to tragedies. Sometimes it leads to you know? Yeah. Who well put, well put, Brooks. Man, I'm proud of you too. Proud of you, <laughs> Erno. No oh God. Do you he's, own my pride? He's he's not gonna be proud of me. I'm in trouble. No. Uh, <laughs> first, I, I will say that the slaying the dragon. I don't look at that as fantasy because that's like the ultimate metaphor. Like me getting up and going to the bank today might be slaying that dragon for the day or, or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's like the slaying the dragon is the metaphor for going out and getting the hunt and bringing it back to the family and feeding the family. So it's like they're real dragons out there. They really need to be slayed. But he's looking for he's making a dragon out of unrealistic things. Yeah. Trying well, to really slay his, dragons that don't need to be slayed, maybe. Exactly. Because really his dragon is warm milk, hot bath, <laughs> <cold rub. laughs> peach well, schnapps. If there is a dragon trail. to slay, like a pimp is like a good target because pimps right. are parasites. Yeah. And like so they need to kind of be destroyed, I think. But uh, there's that's just, that's just my personal opinion. No, no, I feel you. There, there's a bit <laughs> too with like 
the pimp represents like the the dragon that's in front of you. It's your local dragon that you need to slay maybe before you slay the politician and you change so like uh the country. I kind of look at it like that. It's a it's a clean your room before you go and try and change the world it. situation. Right. But, uh, the the other there's so many themes. That's why this movie is so damn good. There's paranoia, isolation, obsession. Right. Uh, he's got a support superiority complex. But I think the big thing that it's saying that's like still super relevant today is what you surround yourself with. Like he chooses to get in the cab and it's almost like he, he's punishing himself. And I, I know like I'm the type I used to like, just like let my fucking house just get like bad. Like in my twenties, mm-hmm. like it would just be a mess. And I would like, let it get there. I'd wallow in it and shit. I was just, like in a bad place. So I recognize the bad place that he's in and you can, uh, you can compare it to like today. If you want to get on Twitter and join the social wars and just surround yourself and all that, then you're going to see social wars everywhere. If you want to get on Fox news or MSNBC all day and wallow in whatever's going on there, that's what you're going to see everywhere when that's not really, he's shaping his view of reality from what he's surrounding himself with. And it seems that he's doing it intentionally. So that's, that's one of the big things I, I take out of it. Just be, be be conscious conscious of what what you're putting in your mind kind of. You know that's that's a great point, and and I'm very proud of you. Actually, you. And <laughs> I, uh, we were talking about when Wizard gave that not so sage advice. So he's not really a wizard at all, right? And he and he just kind of says, "Well, you pick a job, and that's what you are." That's kind of like very prophetic to what he's saying the, mm-hmm. about what's going on with Travis. Travis puts himself in this situation mm-hmm. where he sees the worst of society every single night. He talks about having to clean up the. The, the semen and the blood and everything else and the piss and the shit like like yeah that's all he sees and yeah if you surround yourself with all this bullshit that's all you're gonna see in everything and it's gonna drive you crazy next thing you know and then even when you go crazy and cross a line people will view you as a hero hmm. right I don't know I don't know Jelani what do you think yeah you proud bro Bing, yeah, it's been in the lies of genius and uh, insanity. It's a very thin line, and uh, I, I think I think tra- I mean Travis isn't like uh, he's not a common sense man. I think he has loftier goals, and he wants to be like important in some form or fashion. But he couldn't be important because he chose a path of the least importance. I think he chose a path of being a taxi driver at, at third shift, you know, just driving around, picking the scum of the earth up for in New York city. He chose, like, like we said before, he chose this life and he wanted to be this way. He, he is Verno says he, he chose his reality. The reality he has around him is exactly what he's decided to make it. And because of those things, it, it it poisoned who he is as a person. And I think Travis saw himself as a good person. I think, honestly, at the very beginning of this movie, I think he was a good person. I think he had his levels. But over time, you notice to see that decline. You start to see him. And like I said, all you need, man, all you need is some warm milk and a hot bath and just, you know, get a back rub. You know, just, just figure out Figure out what would make you happy. You need Preach to figure yourself. out what makes you happy. Yeah. Yeah. Get your, get, get your shit together. Put it in a bag. Do whatever you got to do. But you got to get your shit together. And he he just, he, he couldn't contemplate that. He thought, you know, killing the president would make him important. And he thought, you know, or not killing the presidential candidate make him feel important. He, he thought by saving this 12-year-old girl from, from a pimp, was the way to go after he decided uh, the assassination attempt was a dumb idea, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it feels like he wanted to choose a path. He wanted to do, he thought he wanted to do good in one way, but then he chose another way, which actually did do a good thing. He actually did a great thing, but he, he's a crazy person. And the only reason he was a crazy person, cause he didn't get no damn sleep. So please get some sleep. That's all I ask. That's, and you'll be fine. He he would be he'd have been fine. Yeah, insomnia is not is not a great way to be. I agree. I'm That's proud. It. I'm proud of you, Jelani. That was nicely put. Nicely put. All right. It's loneliness. That's the yeah. easiest. That's the easiest thing. But 
and this is what the uh, the writer um whose name is escaping me paul, paul schrader, schrader said that to him the the first theme he thought of was loneliness but as he got through the story he realized that yeah it's loneliness but it's the story of a man in self-imposed isolation right so he's not just he's choosing putting himself in the world to see the the worst of humanity in his eyes he's isolating himself because of it and he has that superiority complex that you were talking about right where he's he's above it so he's putting himself in a position where he feels lofty compared to other people and that leads to these misconceptions of reality and his own emotional state he is not aware of his emotions he's not aware of how to deal with them in any kind of way he is very very childlike what happened with him and his family why is he lying to his family why does he not allow them to know where he is there's a reason for this what happened to him when he was a marine why did he get honorably discharged did he was he even a marine like well, Fable said, yeah. he's got this disgust for society, but this yearning and burning desire to be a part of it. He wants to be accepted. He wants to listen to music. He wants to go on the date. He wants to go to a movie. And by the way, porn movie theaters sold snacks. What the fuck? It's like getting a strip club buffet. Nobody wants chicken wings from a strip club. No. Especially the no. We had really. fire chicken wings. Come on. <laughs> we did. I knew it. We <laughs> it's about that contradictory nature of reality and, and man or, or humans, you know, of us, of our souls, of what of our thoughts. Like we're we're filled with contradictory thoughts. Right. But going beyond that is the hypocrisy of Travis's worldview versus his actual life. He has this worldview of him being superior, of him being this clean prophet. He is God's lonely man. That's like a beautifully profound thing that a lot of people get trapped into thinking they're God's lonely man. I have a purpose. I'm alone for a reason. I have to be isolated. I, I'm not like other people's. I'm a hero. I'm Superman. I can't be happy. I can't do it. Superman's married. He's happy. But it's like that whole thing with the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. At the end, he he can't be with Mary Jane because he's Spider-Man. That, that kind of like self-defeating fucking thing, oh, that's a worldview a lot of people take on, when in reality, what they want is to be fucking wanted, to be touched, to be desired, to be talked to, to be, to be cared for, to fucking be listened to, right? And it goes so far when somebody actually treats you like that and you're not used to it. It can be a very profound experience, as long as you're not filled with self-loathing and self-hatred like he is because he's abusing his body, he's killing himself slowly, he is in a terrible state of being, he's got a terrible diet, he's alcoholic, he's addicted to fucking speed, basically. He is not sleeping, he is not a healthy person, he's not taking care of himself, he hates himself just as much as society. Uh -huh. And all of this comes down to one thing, fear. He's scared. Mm -hmm. He's scared. He's scared to be he's open. He's scared. He's a coward. He's, he's a coward. He doesn't want to be mm -hmm. open. He doesn't want to be vulnerable. He doesn't want to be hurt. He's, he's scared of, of the people in this neighborhood. He's scared of, of everybody and everything. Mm -hmm. And this is the way he reacts. Well, what's the line? It's a tears for fear song. It's hard to be a man when there's a gun in your hand. But a lot of people feel like that's how you be a man. That's how you overcome fear. Well, I got this gun. And that's what he's doing. That's why when he goes and talks mm -hmm. to the special agent, the Secret Service guy, he's filled with this sense of like false superiority. Like he's got one over on him. But he overplayed his fucking card because when he goes to kill the, the Palantino or whatever the fuck. I always thought there was Palpatine. Whenever he goes to kill <laughs> Senator yeah. Palpatine, mm -hmm. it's Palatine, right? Um, he could have saved the galaxy. Exactly. <laughs> Ron would still be here. When he goes there, it's that same security agent that recognizes him. Recognize him. Because yeah. he weird fucking stretched on him. And the dude knew yeah. what. That's why That's why the dude's well, like, give me your name. He says it right there. Give me he your name those, and your address. I see those suspicious people over there. You're the most suspicious person here. Right. He yes. Right. Such a contradiction, yeah. All of this is a reaction to fear. The isolation, whether it's self-imposed, <clears throat> no matter this, like for instance, with the Joker, and when we first when Brooks first came on here after watching Taxi Driver, he's like, I get the Joker comparisons now. The Joker's blaming society for not helping this man. This is more about what this dude has allowed himself to become. He's allowed himself to be in this situation. He had someone reach out to him 
and he fucked it up because he didn't think about it. He wasn't, he, he wasn't, he doesn't think about other people. It's all in his own head. And everything is this paranoid madness that sifts through this movie all the way to the end. And he'll never learn his lesson because he's a hero now. <laughs> it's tragic. It's tragic. So he's going to live in fear his whole life. And who knows? He's going to, who's he, who he's going to kill next. Thank right. God we never got taxi driver two electric boogaloo. All right. Time <laughs> to reach the phone. Out of five possible you digs, you out there in the chat, if you've watched Taxi Driver, and shame if you have not, but watch Taxi Driver and uh, let us know. What do you think? Out of five, you digs, just kick us off, Fable. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I said earlier, I think it's a brilliant character study. Uh, a lot of people, you know, talk about him, his descendant to madness, and they talk about maybe this is a PSD, PTSD kind of thing. But on this watch through in particular, what he reminded me of is undiagnosed autism he doesn't he doesn't have any yes he doesn't have any emotional connection to anything and everything he does is a suggestion from something else if he went into the marines it's because he loved cowboys you know Mm -hmm. it it informed everything informs what his next move is he fell in love with shubba sapper so now he's a political guy now he's got stickers for palantine and everything is uh, his view of what a man should be. Come and save the heroine. Even when she doesn't want to be saved. She's telling you, I don't want to be don't saved. Save her. Got, she don't want to be what? saved. Are you crazy? <laughs> you know, don't you want to be saved by me? Uh, this is how it's supposed to go, right? So for me in this watch too, I got that. And I don't mean that as a joke. I'm not trying to be funny or anything. But that's what I got from it. Like this man is autistic and this is before they could even diagnose something like that so we know people like this in life before the diagnosis came and after the diagnosis came um and and it's, and it's brilliant in that way it's brilliant in that way it shows it so much it shows so much aspects of that mentality so um five five your digs five, five your digs five. perfect score from fable what about you brooks well i mean i, I like this movie a lot but it's kind of a vic- for me. It's kind of a victim of its own success, as far as like you know, its grittiness and its like grimness. It doesn't make like I would love to watch it again. But it's, it's a movie. It's like the, the the grimness of it kind of like makes me less enthused to watch it. You know, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a movie I'd have to be in the right mood to watch. I'd give it a four point five. Like okay. it's, it's it's really good. Like it's a classic and everything. Like and I get it, but it is it is a very it's a very dark movie, you know, and sometimes that can be not so easy to watch, even if, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, even, you know, it, it can put, it can kind of send you in a dark place sometimes, I think, so. If we ever do send you, Brooks is giving that bitch a two. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. I'd give it a one. I love how we are. We The movies we cover, the love we have for movies, that when we have to justify a 4.5. Right. I love that. I love that. I love that. 4.5, that's awesome. I, I did that with Misery on Saturday. I was like, look, guys, I'm not trying to be that guy. It's a 4.5. But you were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was, I hobbled that shit. Anyway, Verno, <laughs> what about you? What do you rate this film? Uh, I mean, just from its the like the influence that this film has on, on the rest of the films that came after it, I'll give it a five all day. It's there's nowhere that I could really think to ding it. You know what I mean? There's, there's not a character I don't like. There's not a line that I don't like. There's a musical cue or two that I don't like, but the music is so fucking good that that, that doesn't really uh, take anything away from it. The, the other last thing I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed about the movie was the very, 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 very end after the credits roll, the music gets really ominous. And then it shows you this long, the, this shot of, like down a highway or something with just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars. And to me, what that told me is like another, another part of the theme that we bring up all the time on DHS is that you never know what someone's thinking or you never know what someone's like. And you just look in that sea. And my thought is like, there's at least a couple more Travis's out there in this sea. And then you just look at the world and how many Travis's are out there. So uh, it's a brilliant movie. And I will highly recommend to watch the commentary but Robbie, you said you watched the uh, the Scorsese one, and I, I listened to some of that. And I put on the there's one that's done by like a film historian that comes with the Blu-ray, and he does a great job of pointing out 
the genius of Scorsese and the the camera angles. And that, that's what I wanted out of Scorsese's commentary. And it's really, really, really interesting. I wish I knew his name, but it's, it's the film historian on the thing. And it really just shows you and highlights like, God damn, like every decision that Scorsese makes is like levels ahead of anywhere that I would ever think. But it, it all makes sense what this guy says. So, And this is still early in his career. You know, right. like he, like it's 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 astonishing to me. And yeah, there's like three or four commentaries on the on the Blu-ray. So right. definitely hey, check that one out. Does Mean Streets is it at this level? Is it something that I'm gonna be? Am I gonna go back and be like, oh, this one's more dated? I would go Mean Streets just a little bit below it, but Mean Streets is like the Mean Streets is like the forerunner for movies like this and nice. Goodfellas and After Hours and not just other Scorsese films, but. Mean Streets is definitely worth watching. Nice. Hell yeah. Sure. Hell sure. yeah. Five years. It's, it's his first movie that felt this is the first movie that he did where he's defined what Scorsese esque means. Nice. Is Mean Streets. And he just gets better from there. So hell yeah. Another perfect score from Verno. What about you, Jelani? Well, like I said, it's not a it's not a repeat watcher. It's it's like one of those, oh my goodness, I saw it. I mean, it was there. It's great. It's fantastic. I mean, I, I can't really lie. It is a beautiful character study, but it is hard to watch at times. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, and, and not because of that, but because I've seen it and I've enjoyed it both times, even though it's as it, dark as it gets. Uh, and, the, and the music's fantastic. Every character plays their part. Even like Albert Brooks. We never mentioned Albert Brooks once. He's a goofy character in this movie, and yeah, he's, he's goofy, but he has a purpose. And, and and I like how Travis assumes that he knows uh, he and Civil Shepherd's relationship, you know, how they are. And he's like, I think he talks down to you, and I don't think I like that. And, you know, and I feel like that that's not that's something because I've been watching you for like days, <laughs> but you know, it's 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 just that in the little things like that. And Scorsese is a brilliant director, anyway. Um, this is one of those films that if you if you are a film nut, you need to watch it. And I'm surprised you haven't watched it. It's just one of those one of those classic films that you got to get in your repertoire just to understand what film used to be because it ain't what it is now. And you know we 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 don't have that originality anymore. We lost we we lost a lot of that. You know there are glimmers of hopes in, in certain things and certain directors. But we, it's few and far between like, like it is now. And so I have to put this at a five. I can't, I cannot not make it as a five. It's, it's just one of those cultural touchstones, like, like Joe says. It's just one of those things that we have to like preserve and latch on to and show others that, you know, things, things weren't PC in the world things things happen shit happens birth of the nation is the first movie we ever watched it was played in the white house and it and it glorifies the ku klux klan but it happened that shit happened so it, it, i'm not comparing that to taxi driver of we course can't but erase our history, i think right you we, can't erase yeah, you can't well, erase keeps us humble happen. this yeah, it, it happened so we got to watch it at least once we got to get it out and so i'm going to say it's a 5 it's, it's just a clean five. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, I I mean, like I said, mesmerizing, haunting, hypnotizing, beautiful, layered, lots of subtext, lots of meaning, lots of cool, memorable moments, a little bit of comedy, uh, a very real look at, at struggle, a very real look at New York, a very real look at New York and life at this time from people who were there who knew how to convey that it is absolutely astonishing i think it is one of the most important films of all time i wouldn't say it's the best scorsese film would i i don't know it's no, up there i'm giving it five yeah, five you digs yeah. perfect score um robert de niro uh sybil shepherd everybody in the movie and yeah, even Albert fucking nerdy ass Brooks, right, is in there. Right? <laughs> and there, just the way it's shot, really defining the style. This was, you know, I said that Mean Streets was the first film by Scorsese that felt like, okay, this is Scorsese, but this is where he really starts stretching, right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't stop stretching for a while. 
And he's always trying to do something different. I don't like every single uh, Scorsese film. He did this movie called Shutter Island, which I fucking detest, to be honest. Oh, with yeah. You. I don't like that. But, uh, <laughs> I went to the theater when they came out. Oh, God. I hated that twist ending. That was garbage. Not everything is good, but, you know, I still love Alice Doesn't Live Here anymore and Age of Innocent as, as well. We so, gotta watch Wall Street. Uh, yeah, I still haven't bro. seen that. I do have gotta to watch, watch it. it. Oh, gotta watch it. Gotta watch it. Yeah, I got to. Um, we got some good uh, out there in the chat. We had uh, 4.5s and we had fives all around. So five from everybody on the panel, except for Brooks, who gave it a 4.5. That's a PCP Solid. average of 4.960. 4. 4.96. Nice. Oh. All right. Sometimes the math doesn't work out the way we want to, but that's okay. <laughs> we're not going to... We're not going to deliberately contradict and confuse ourselves like Travis Pickle does in Taxi Driver. All right. How do we follow up such an intense discussion like we had tonight on Taxi Driver? How about for the film that every single PCP movie night has been leading up to? This is going to be the most important show ever. Next week, join us. We're talking about Surf Ninjas, my man. <laughs> surf Ninjas. Oh, and I couldn't man. even get the, the thumbnail to, to, I had to find like the shittiest image. I couldn't even get a good image to not have the kid's head covered up by our logo, but that's okay. <laughs> we got Rob and Ernie on there. So Surf Ninjas next week. That's going to be a fun show. Joe Corrala is going to be here. Manny's going to be here. Uh, and I think Greg from Bearded Comic Bro is going to be here. So that's going to be super nice. fun. Thursday night, the monthly comic book review is going to be live at 7 p.m. Central Time with me and Nick and Manny and Greg and Brian. It's going to be a great, grand old time talking about the best comics of January, even though DC is going to sneak one more new comic book day in because they're on Tuesdays. But we don't recognize that Tuesday bullshit here at PCP. It all is the same week to us. Um, but Saturday night, join us for Dylan's Horror Show, Tourist Trap. I've never seen that one, y'all. Oh. And Dylan talks it up. So I'm excited. Oh boy. To check it out. And also Dylan will be doing his uh, Twilight Zone show on a uh, Friday night as well. Fable, thank you for being here. Thank you for partaking of Taxi Driver with us. What you got coming up other than just the best fucking Instagram show out there? <laughs> uh, well, this Saturday we, we, we're taking off because I have to work, unfortunately. So no blame Fable this Saturday. But we're coming back the following Saturday. Hopefully the schedule is okay. And, you know, same same great topics, great guests. The last show was awesome. We talked about a, a bunch of stuff. Um, so, yeah, catch that on the Rewind. I always try to get people to go to the One Collection down YouTube um, because that's where I post all the replays. So, please, guys, if you're not subbed up, sub up to One Collection down and catch the replays on Blame Fable and his amazing friends. Thank you, Robbie, for having me. I love doing these review shows with you guys, man. Hell yeah. Love having you on here. And if somebody could throw out the link to the One Collection Down YouTube channel, that would be delightful. Brooks, thank you for being here. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, not really. Huh? Well, I mean, I, pray, I think, I, I think I've, I've expended all of my, my energy on this one. See, Brooks has been on so many of these guys. He doesn't even thank me. He's like, you know, everybody else is like, thanks for having me. Brooks is like, yeah, I got nothing, man. <laughs> You're lucky to have me. We are lucky to have you, Brooks. Thank you for joining us. Vern, oh, yeah. Blood Splatter Chatter is your Instagram account. Everybody needs to check that out because you do good content there. Hey, thank you. Blood dot splatter dot chatter. Uh, yeah, man, go check it out. I'm having fun posting horror stuff. One day, one day, I'm going to start a horror podcast. I, I, I said it on the internet now, so it's going to happen. Do it. I, I, I'm, I'm committed. I swear it. it is going to happen. But uh, yeah, you man. You can't allow I, me I, to commit to every episode because I want to, but you can't allow me to, man. I'll wreck my life, man. But <laughs> I, want, I, want, I, want, I want that to happen so bad, bro. One, maybe once a month. One, once a month. We, 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 can, <laughs> we can figure something out. But uh, no, man, yeah, this is one, like I said, I soon as I saw you guys doing it i was stoked that you were doing it i wanted to be on it glad i checked it off the list and it's already begun a, a score this is gonna be like scorsese week here at my house all right I, i'm looking through this right now i've seen most of his big ones but i've never seen raging bull either so that's that's the next oh. one up for me and i believe it's the next oh, one he did after this correct me if i'm wrong my tim and de niro i know that yeah it's in 1980 yeah that's yeah, good so one. i'm stoked yeah. i feel oh, like uh, so aviators good. underrated I love the Aviator, actually. Yeah, I, I really like do like the Aviator. Oh, yeah, me too. I also like the, uh, Gangs of New York. <laughs> Gangs of New York. Yeah, Gangs of New York. Yeah. Gangs of New York. yeah. Yeah, there's some good ones, man. Um, by the way, we, we are doing another Scorsese film in April. It's going to be good, fellas, but we're finally going to yeah. do it. So. Yeah, awesome. Everybody here on this panel is going to be invited to that one first because 
I think we got the Scorsese crew right here, and I'm down for it, man. I'm down for the Scorsese <laughs> crew. Jelena. I was going to say, hey, that was in New York too, right? Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, cover your ears. Uh, Jelani, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's coming up on – Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, we, we do this thing, uh, Brooks and I, called uh, Go Figure Reviews, and uh, we review toys and such. Uh, Great title. Week, Great title. Yeah, thanks. Love yeah, that. I found out other people have it, but we're going to like make it the best. So I came up with it. Uh, yeah, you totally and did. They're liars. Yeah, Nobody they are. thought of that for me. That's right. Impossible. That's right. So, yeah, this week, uh, we will be doing a, one of these figures since we don't do show and tales anymore, and I'm dropping oh, stuff. But nice. we're doing Cyclops, the cell shaded Cyclops with slide effects. Um, the slide oh. effects are going to be these 3D print resin figure uh, things that we're going to try to put on this Cyclops to make him cool. Um, but it's hard that's to make Cyclops of the, cool. Hey. Yeah. It oh, is. Man. We're going to totally yeah, talk about this. Cool. <laughs> and, and then also this week, we're also doing um, uh, Brooks. Brooks is doing his Amiibos from uh, the Nintendo figures and such. We're going to do a, a video on that. And also, we're going to have Robbie on, and he's going to be talking about these figures. Y'all. Yeah. He's a lovely He Man Masterverse figures, the He Man nice. and the Skeletor. Nice. Oh, We're gonna do the Masters so of the bad. Universe uh, figures yes. uh, this time, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good time. We'll probably get you know a little tipsy, a little high on top of all things. This is me like seriously living through you because like I want those figures, but I'm not gonna buy them. So like I'm just gonna be like. <laughs> like, like I'm just like it's oh, like I'm coming over. Skeletor, with, man. I love it. This is like old school. It's like, can we come yeah. out and play toys? You want to come over and play? Let's let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's go play. So we're having a play date, and that's what we're doing. Uh, the, pretty much this week on Go Figure Reviews, I'm gonna we're going to try to drop three videos this week. So if you guys will watch, thank you so much. We have 101 subscribers already. Nice. So thank wow. you for all of that. We really appreciate oh, yeah. it. Uh, follow us on on uh, Go Figure Reviews. I'm working on the Instagram page because uh, even though I I can't, I, I'll try. I'll see how that goes. Dude, and then we're perfect, gonna try to get man, the streaming the up once I get my internet back the way it's supposed to be, <laughs> how it worked. And then we'll we'll have our streamings. So yeah. Thanks oh, guys for watching. It's gonna be a fun it. week. Gonna be a fun week. Uh Thursday, join us for the monthly comic book review, 7 p.m. Central Time. Join me Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. Haven't even made this announcement really, but Anna Mia is coming back to join us for the channel nice. uh, for a conversation. And she's always a delight to have. And uh, that's going to be a fun conversation. Saturday night, Dylan's Horror Show. Also on Friday night is Dylan's uh, Twilight Zone show with Scarpad. And then join us next week, Surf Fucking Ninjas, y'all. <laughs> I'm so goddamn excited. I'm so ready. It's a movie so good, I could only find it on DVD. So, so, I, just, yeah, but whatever, I, gotta get Drew. I still haven't gotten Drew to get it. For it's not it's, not anyway. it's a deep uh, character study of surfing and ninjas. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a central 90s movie. All right, y'all. Thank you all so much for joining us. Station, pop, pop, boom, motherfucker, come on. <laughs> <laughs>